This is the fourth lecture on uh, seismic reflection in uh, GPH 492692. Last time I talked about seismic acquisition for uh, reflection surveys, and now I'm going to talk about processing for reflection surveys. Uh, you've probably noticed by now that I have about uh, three times as many lectures on uh, reflection as I do on uh, REMI or uh, seismic refraction. So um, uh, that gives you some idea of the complexity that's involved here uh, and uh, the number of steps. Now we will uh, get to apply uh, all of the acquisition steps in uh, our field ex excursion and uh, then uh, in our uh, seismic reflection lab, uh, which will be in, uh, in March, we'll uh, apply these uh, processing steps. and. Uh, uh, and also make some interpretations. So um, this is a, um, a kind of a glossary um, uh, to start out with of uh, some of the, uh, the names of uh, seismic uh, reflection processing um, routines um, and a little bit of description of uh, uh, what they're for and um, when you uh, when you need to apply them, and some things that can uh, get in your way and uh, prevent you from uh, applying them correctly. The ones that I've highlighted in yellow are the ones uh, that we effectively, uh, we, you know, whether we know it or not, we do it um, with the uh, reflection data that that we're going to uh, to collect and analyze. Um, and uh, for your reference, uh, the other ones that are not highlighted are ones that you might read about in papers. Uh, if you, uh, you know, read or abstract any papers on uh, seismic reflection work uh, in, that uh, includes some description of the, of the processing. So that's what this is for. Uh, it's a two-page glossary. Um, let me just go through a few of the steps. Um, Let's see. I'll uh, I'll skip gain recovery because that uh, that happens uh, uh, automatically in our in our instrument. Um, but vertical stacking is something that uh, while it uh, it happens automatically, um, it's a technique that you need to be uh, well aware of. Uh, what we're doing is um, essentially we record a record um, when uh, the hammer hits the uh, uh, the plate uh, for us, you know, or when the the vibrator sweep starts, or uh, when the the blast goes off, and that's the zero time for the record, and the uh, the seism the seismograph uh, is responsible for recording all the channels uh, uh, and all the uh, uh, the wave data from uh, from all the geophones um, from that time until the maximum time that we that we set. Um, but what we need to do is, um, you know, one hammer hit is uh, it's only 150 joules uh, uh, according to my calculation, and that's not often enough to uh, see uh, very many waves at, at a distance of, distance of more than say uh, 30 or 50 meters. So to build up our our uh, signal to noise ratio, uh, the first thing that we do is that we um, we want to hit the plate uh, ten times. Now we could uh, we could have ten plates and ten hammers and and uh, swing them all at once, and uh, you know that would be uh, quite adequate. Uh, although uh, it might be real hard to coordinate uh, uh, ten hammers to be uh, uh, to hit the the plate all at exactly the same time. So uh, uh, what it's actually easier to do is to put an accelerometer on the the shaft of the hammer, uh, and in the acquisition photos uh, that you saw in the video, um, you could see the the wire coming off the uh, the sensor uh, and running down the hammer handle. So um, that uh, accelerometer sends a signal to the seismograph, you know, when the uh, the hammer head hits the plate, and it gets a good uh, a good whack and and sends uh, a voltage to the seismograph, and that's how the seismograph knows what the zero time of the record is, uh, because of course, um, you know, it takes uh, nanoseconds uh, for the electrical signal to get from the hammer to the seismograph, even if it's, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, hundreds of meters away because uh, that travels at the speed of light. So uh, there's uh, effectively no delay in that, uh, in that signal. Uh, so um, the seismograph uh, records, uh, you know, to, at this uh, uh, time, which is, um, uh, you know, good to uh, probably a fraction of a microsecond. And then uh, we hit the, the, after that recording is done, uh, which might only be half a second, we hit the plate again. Okay. And um, so that, uh, that's another recording. Now, if we just add those together, we get that nice, uh, you know, square root of n increase in signal to noise ratio that uh, uh, that we want. So, if we uh, if we add together four hammer hits, then we'll have twice as uh, twice the signal to noise, you know, everything else being equal, uh, that we would have with uh, one hammer hit, and. Uh, you know, eight hammer hits is uh, is pretty good. Uh, you know, sixteen would be four times the signal to noise ratio, uh, but that's a lot of work. So we often stop at ten. Uh, I'm not sure. You know, it's not um, it's not very often that we do um, real tests of uh, you know do we uh, do we record uh, you know four hits or sixteen hits or thirty two hits, um, but uh, a good compromise between uh, you know, wearing everybody out, hitting, you know, swinging the hammer, and um, uh, getting uh, uh, getting some reasonably good data seems to be that uh, ten hits. You know, for that we get about a, a factor of uh, three uh, in increase in signal to noise ratio. So that's uh, vertical stacking. Okay, and um, uh, you know the 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 things that can confuse that. Uh, are you know what if the, all the hammer hits are not exactly the same? You know what if uh, we have a bounced hammer hit, or or what if uh, uh, there's kind of a false? Uh, you know you can just set the hammer down on the ground, and suddenly the accelerometer will still, you know, send a signal to the uh, seismograph, and it'll fire away, and basically record uh, you know the record with no source, which is just noise. So. Um, uh, uh, that's uh, that's one of the things we have to watch out for. Um, now, uh, when we when we uh, when we do this summing, we do it uh, in the seismograph in the field, so it's irreversible. You know, uh, once the sum has been accomplished, um, there is a there is a way to uh, uh, you know if you realize you've gotten a bad trigger, and that's why the whoever is running the seismograph has to be uh, aware of what's going on. Um, you know, once the uh, uh, you know they, they can delete uh, the last record if they think it was bad, uh, and tell the uh, the guy doing the hammering to uh, um, to go uh, you know one more time. Um, but uh, you know, if you uh, if you accumulate say uh, three bad records, then uh, the only thing you can do is just start that uh, that source point all over again. So. Um, you know this uh, summing procedure that we use is uh, uh, really um, uh, requires a lot of vigilance in the field, and in fact, um, some of my colleagues who are very very productive and very very good at co at collecting uh, hammer seismic data, um, they they've actually abandoned that. They separately record every single record, and they sum them later, and that's uh, uh, that's probably a better procedure. Um, but uh, it does mean that there's uh, a bit too much processing to do uh, uh, after the fact. Uh, you know, it is a lot easier to uh, be vigilant while you're recording the data, and um, uh, and then have uh, you know good data to uh, uh, a smaller amount of good data to look at without that summing step having to having to happen. Uh, you know, with your intervention. Now, when we are um, uh, taking a look at the quality of the the records, you know, how do we know that we have a bad hammer hit? Well, we gotta we gotta plot it, and the screen of our seismograph, you know, will show us the forty eight traces that we've just recorded, at least uh, out to uh, some of the time. Uh, you know, we'll be looking at uh, uh, some of the record and all of the uh, you know the signal that that we've been stacking summing together from all of the geophones. Um, and, and often, uh, you know, there's the problem that uh, uh, the geophones that are very close to the hammer, you know, they're very, uh, they see very strong waves, 
and the uh, the ones that are farther away, you can't really see anything. It's hard to find a, a way to plot those uh, uh, together. So uh, often we we employ what's called a gain function. It can be um, and and we usually employ it just for plotting. Okay, um, so uh, you know we'll boost up the uh, the amplitudes that are later in time, right? Because you know seismic waves die out with time and distance. And uh, so, if we want to see what we've got, we might have to uh, boost their amplitude artificially. Um, and also, um, the record the geophones that are uh, uh, at um, further distances, they also uh, often need to be gained up, okay, just to uh, just to see what's going on, what kind of waves are coming in, and be able to see some. Uh, um, um, some phases. So the the gain function uh, is uh, often known in the processing software we, uh, that I'll have you using. It's known as uh, trace equalization gain or TE gain. And it's also known as um, uh, AGC or um, that's short for automatic gain control. All right. So um, uh, we often do that just for uh, for visualizing the data, uh, or if we're going to apply it to the data permanently, we'll we'll make a function that's reversible. Then there's a whole slew, you know. Those are um, you know just basic um, uh, basic functions that uh, are kind of data reduction functions. Okay, data recording functions. Uh, these geometric corrections are um, uh, really getting at the meat of the problem, and that's you know we've we've looked at, been looking at the equations you know for say NMO, and uh, I've mentioned the stacking chart, and I'll I'll talk more about the stacking chart. All right, so this process of uh, uh, of reordering the data so that uh, instead of looking at shot gathers, you know one one source recorded by uh, many geophones. Uh, we're looking at a, a record that uh, has the the uh, the range uh, of uh, distances recorded, but all centered on the same midpoint and the same uh, you know as 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 uh, they would say classically uh, the CDP the common depth point. Okay, so here uh, CMP is uh, short for common midpoint, uh, which is maybe a, a little bit more geometrically correct and simple term. And um, that's uh, something that will be uh, handled for us. But um, uh, sometimes we need to do a CMP sort just to figure out uh, what's going on with the data, uh, where we have um, uh, certain kinds of uh, effects uh, like dip and, and uh, uh, maybe truncated reflections. Uh, we, we, need to, we need to get the uh, CMP sort, and that helps us figure things out. There's also a time correction for elevation differences. You know, you don't always have your uh, geophones all at the same elevation with every shot, so uh, or every hammer hit. So uh, you need to make up those time differences, and I, I showed you some equations for, uh, you know, what those time corrections would be uh, in the context of seismic refraction. Exactly the same equations you can apply here for seismic reflection. Okay. Uh, and uh, you know there's there's some pitfalls because uh, you have to assume a velocity, and um, uh, also if you have uh, you know very long offsets, very wide uh, angles of incidence and reflection, um, you know the equations that are often used are uh, may not be right. So um, uh, while this problem is uh, is uh, handled automatically most of the time uh, in in the the work that you'll do. Uh, it um, it may not be correctly handled if uh, you know if the seismic line uh, has a uh, you know huge ele elevation variations. Okay, then there's the um, um, the process of uh, velocity analysis, which is uh, uh, definitely going to be I think the hardest part of the uh, the seismic reflection uh, lab exercise, and that's where we uh, we estimate um, the NMO velocity of the of the reflectors. You know the velocity that the uh, reflection hyperbolas are asymptotic to, uh, 
And we can also uh, use the Dick's equation after that to uh, estimate interval velocities. Okay, so um, that's a very time-consuming uh, um, uh, procedure. Uh, not at all because of the, you know, the calculation time is not nothing, but uh, it's pretty minimal. The, you know, in the context these days, um, and uh, uh, what's uh, what's really time-consuming is that. Uh, uh, velocity analysis requires human intervention. Okay, so uh, it's uh, uh, you know it's best done by a trained analyst, and it takes a lot of time. Uh, so uh, that's uh, it's expensive for that reason. Okay, and then uh, once the velocities have been found, there's a process of NMO correction. You you correct out using the velocities. You correct out. The uh, normal move out, and you uh, basically correct the time on on the traces that are not at zero offset to the you know where that reflection would be at uh, zero offset. So it's a time shift, um, and the times uh, uh, the times get uh, uh, you know minimized in that way. Now that uh, uh, that process assumes uh, zero dip and all kinds of Assumptions that are not generally true, especially for shallow, high-resolution surveys. So, uh, uh, you know, NMO correction is uh, basically good for uh, a first look at the data, and you're certainly going to going to, you know, do a uh, CMP sort NMO correction and stack to get a, you know, your first look at the the sections of the data that uh, your uh, uh, that you've recorded, say, uh, during the spring break. Um, but uh, there are much better ways of uh, of getting sections. Okay, now there's uh, all kinds of data enhancement uh, procedures, which we might apply, um, you know, in the field. We might apply, um, you know, before or after velocity analysis and NMO correction. We might apply them uh, on shot gathers. We might apply them on on CMP gathers. We might apply them to the final uh, stack section. You know, the final uh, Time section uh, that uh, uh, you know should be showing us uh, the structure, and the the one that we'll use the most, and we'll mostly use it uh, before stack, um, before velocity analysis, is uh, the bandpass filter, um, known in the software we have as the BP filter. Okay, and. Um, uh, that will help us, um, uh, you know, at least we'll be able to de decrease uh, um, noise that has uh, frequencies that are outside the band of the the frequency band of the reflections themselves. So the reflections, if you know, based on the experience um, as I've seen it here in this class, you know, the reflections that we'll record will be somewhere, uh, you know, they may be. Uh, Appearing between frequencies of say uh, seventy and uh, and two hundred hertz, okay, um, and below seventy uh, hertz, we may have strong surface waves, okay, and we can attenuate those surface waves with a with a uh, low cut filter, okay, um, and uh, you know above. Uh, um, Above 200 hertz, uh, we may have air waves and uh, uh, and other kinds of noise, such as uh, as wind noise, uh, and and that uh, you know we can attenuate with a a high cut filter. Okay, so you put the, the low cut filter together with a a high cut filter, and you have a bandpass filter. You know we would say want to pass uh, all frequencies between um, uh, between 70 and 200 hertz. So, uh, uh, and you know, in lab, we'll examine some of the pitfalls of uh, of the bandpass filter. You know, it's it's uh, way too easy to get too aggressive with the the band the frequency filtering, and start uh, you know taking big bites out of your actual data. Um, there are two um, uh, D filters uh, that we might use. I haven't highlighted it uh, because we haven't typically used it, but. Uh, we might need to do that uh, uh, occasionally. Um, 
these are uh, essentially uh, velocity filters, or you know, as a, uh, you know, looking at a uh, at a time section, you know, they're 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 called dip filters. All right. So uh, that you know, these these uh, FK filters, these two D filters, these dip filters, they give us a way of say eliminating the very slow um, uh, air waves and service waves. Um, you know, not based on their frequency, but instead based on their slope. Uh, and then we uh, we can hopefully leave the uh, the much faster apparent velocity arrivals, which should be the the reflections, right? The reflections can even be flat. And then uh, uh, the principal data enhancement technique that we use is this stack. Okay, so uh, we use the uh, the the CDP stack or the CMP stack. Uh, in in my software, it's called the CMP stack for common midpoint stack. Uh, that that procedure does a uh, a common midpoint sort. It does an NMO correction based on a based on a velocity model that you pick uh, before beforehand, and uh, then um, uh, then you um, um, uh, and then it uh, it takes all of the uh, NMO corrected uh, traces around the same midpoint. And adds them adds them together, you know, at uh, their corresponding times. Okay, so that's called a sometimes it's called a horizontal stack to distinguish it from the uh, the stack of the the hits that that happens the summing that happens in the seismograph uh, because it's really taking uh, data from uh, you know that's that's taken in different places but still around the same midpoint and adding it together. So uh, horizontal stack uh, in the industry, of course, just called uh, the stack. I mean, this uh, industry is full of jargon, and so hopefully this uh, this list will will help you uh, to see uh, to get around that jargon. Um, so uh, it's the stack that uh, that takes our our time sections and our our records, well, not our time sections, but our our shot records, our common midpoint records, our common death point records. And creates a, a section. You know, it'll still be a time section, but it'll be a section where we we might expect to be able to find, uh, you know, some geology. Okay, and that's uh, it's not exactly a section, uh, uh, a geological section yet, but it is uh, it is getting closer. So, uh, you know, our first interpretations, you know, say of depths and and what uh, you know what we're looking at, those interpretations will take place uh, on the product of the stack. And then I've uh, re-emphasized the trace equalize and the automatic gain control functions here uh, because they're they're very good to use uh, uh, after stack. And there's also um, places uh, like uh, you know when you record reflection data in an urban environment, it's very good to use uh, uh, the uh, the AGC and the trace equalization before stack. Um, so it's uh, it's worth. Uh, uh, Worth uh, uh, mentioning that again. Now that's as far as it will probably go in this class. Um, but um, you know, I've I've mentioned a few times that uh, you know NMO correction and uh, CDP sorting and and the uh, CDP stacking, CMP stacking. You know, those are all. Um, uh, procedures that uh, dep that assume that the geology is flat, right? And that's not very interesting. Why would you need to do a survey if the geology was flat? So it's these imaging procedures that start to get around um, the limitations of of the procedures I've talked about so far. Uh, these geometric corrections and and can actually uh, you know correctly position uh, dipping events and and correctly uh, render uh, their dip. Okay, so you can take a stack and you can do uh, what's called a, uh, a post-stack migration. Okay, and it will migrate the uh, the dipping events uh, to their at least closer to their true position. Uh, and um, at that point, uh, you can do a uh, conversion to depth, which will be fairly accurate, and the dips should be uh, about right. Now uh, we won't do it in this class, but um, uh, I, I'm thinking I, I should probably replace a lot of the processing with um, 
uh, you know, especially the geometric corrections with this uh, pre-stack mi migrate uh, uh, process. So uh, that's one uh, that uh, uh, you know directly doesn't go through uh, NMO correction. It doesn't go through uh, CDP sorting. Uh, you start with your essentially uh, raw shot records, and you end up with a depth section. Okay, um, and that's uh, um, uh, it's it's uh, not always that you need to uh, to go to that uh, that extent. It's a very complicated procedure. Um, you really aren't going to uh, um, be able to effectively uh, use pre-stack migration until um, until uh, you you've done some very very good and very very thorough velocity analysis, uh, but now that you know, we have tools like uh, SizeOptit two D to figure out uh, velocity in great detail and how velocity changes laterally, especially, uh, it's it's much more easier, much more easy, and and much more common now to do this kind of pre stack migration. You might have heard the terms uh, uh, PSTM and and PSDM. Uh, uh, you might see those in, in uh, papers in the last uh, 10 or 15 years uh, that are uh, looking at uh, processing and imaging seismic reflection data. Uh, PSTM is pre-stack time migration, uh, which is uh, uh, you know it's a better way of getting uh, closer to true dip, um, and especially in uh, in three dimensions and and uh, uh, and in most areas where uh, you know, unlike in the in the basin and range here uh, in Nevada, uh, where you don't have uh, you know huge variations in velocity from uh, seismic velocity from one place to another, yet at the same depth. Okay, um, and uh, if you do have that, and and you know in the shallow subsurface uh, with high resolution surveys, we often have you know really severe you know factors of two or three changes in velocity just by moving sideways a few. Uh, a few meters. Uh, in that case, uh, we have to go all the way with uh, uh, what's called the uh, pre-stack depth migration. Okay, and the the word depth is kind of a, a key word that says that we have done everything we can to to get that velocity section correct, uh, and we've used uh, you know maybe different data types to uh, to predict velocities and. Uh, the PSDM is the way of, of correctly rendering those structures given uh, that detailed velocity section. Um, and uh, PSDM is not worth much if we don't have those velocity details. But like I said, with um, you know, size up to 2D sections, which you have uh, you know, for, um, from our, uh, uh, our, our refraction lab, OK? Uh, then we do have uh, we do have the appropriate velocity information, and we could take advantage of that. So uh, I don't think I'll be able to do it for this class, but um, uh, I'm eventually going to get to the point where I will uh, give you guys uh, pre-stack depth mig migration tools. Uh, and uh, uh, so you know, if you're interested in that, check back in a couple of years, and I can probably give you uh, free software that. Uh, We'll do the uh, the full PS uh, PSDM uh, pre stack depth migration uh, from whatever data you have. Uh, and this last one, uh, you know, forming the database and doing a uh, an uh, an interpretation, you know, especially of a three D seismic uh, data volume, um, used to be an extremely elaborate procedure, and now. Um, you know, if you have a three D data set, you can get free open source software. That will allow you to uh, import that data set, view it in 3D, uh, in in many different and useful ways, and uh, you know make stratigraphic and structural interpretations of that data set, you know, really quite easily. So uh, this is one place where uh, you know advances in uh, you know graphics cards and gaming technology, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, you know the fun part of uh, computers has uh, benefited the work that we want to do too. Uh, and if that interests you, I can direct you, uh, you know, where to download the free software, and um, uh, we have lots of uh, lots of data sets that students have worked on here uh, that you could take a look at too. So that's a, a summary of, of seismic processing um, 
you know, kind of a glossary of terms. And what I'd like to do now is uh, just show you some examples of uh, uh, a couple of different data sets, uh, very simple data sets, very small data sets that uh, uh, with, with various kinds of processing applied. So this display here is um, a uh, set of, um, of six uh, shot records, which are just laid out uh, side by side. Uh, the vertical axis is, uh, is time. Uh, and uh, let's see, it's going down to half a second, 500 milliseconds. OK. And uh, on, um, on the left-hand side, we have um, a source at the south end of uh, 12 channels, which extend to the north. And you can see uh, this, um, uh, this kind of uh, zipper uh, effect. OK. Uh, there's this, you know, set of tilted lines that ex that uh, are down to the left. Okay, um, and you can see that there's uh, two slopes of tilted lines. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see it in the video, but um, there's uh, these uh, high frequency um, waves here. Uh, maybe you can see it better uh, uh, over here, uh, and um, those are. Uh, uh, so in these six, they're present in all these six records, and uh, what is that? Well, uh, if you uh, you know look at the distance to each geophone and the time that it takes to get from you know the source end to the other end of the array, you can figure out pretty quickly that uh, this wave here is traveling at at uh, I think it was uh, 334 meters per second, um, and so that's the air wave uh, being high frequency, you know, with these very narrow peaks like this is another good sign that it's an air wave. Um, you know, even, even here, you know, it's appearing low frequency for some reason, but uh, still not as low as, as the other waves. Still high frequency uh, and sharper. Um, and there's actually a wave that's slower than that. Okay, and this is uh, uh, a survey recorded on the bed of Washoe Lake. So uh, those waves are, uh, are Rayleigh waves. You know, they're recorded with vertical uh, um, vertical component uh, geophones, so they've got to be Rayleigh waves, and and um, you know they've got to be some kind of S wave because they're slower than the uh, than the air wave. Okay, and uh, this was done at a time when uh, Washoe Lake uh, had uh, some water in it and um, uh, and was quite muddy, so uh, you'd expect the uh, the mud to be quite slow to uh, S waves. Um, now then, uh, uh, so those are the you know most of the energy in these in these six records, and there there are more. These these are kind of just six you know taken, uh, spaced out uh, you know down the the entire route route of the survey. There's many more records in between. I think this is like every tenth record. Okay, uh, when we get up to the northern edge, we start to see some. Uh, of these waves coming in that are uh, more um, horizontal, they're not they're not dipping as steeply, tilted as steeply as uh, uh, as these uh, uh, very slow waves. Okay, and these much um, these waves that have a much higher apparent velocity. Well, you know, up here where there it's the first arrival, that's got to be the refraction, right? Uh, and um, and then this wave that's behind it, at least that we can see right here, that is a uh, that's a reflection, and maybe you can see hints of its hyperbolic um, its 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 hyperbolic move out, uh, normal move out N of O. Okay, so this is pretty much how the data looks, um, you know, right in the seismograph, graph, right out of the field, it's dominated totally by the uh, uh, by the air waves and surface waves. Uh, but at least we can see some, you know, hints of reflections, and and you know, uh, at least there's not too much noise that uh, in some places we can see the first arrivals. That's that's important too. Okay, now to to see what else might be in this data set, we can apply automatic gain control. Okay, so what that is going to do is it sweeps through each trace and it says, all right, you know, here. The uh, average, the RMS uh, power is is low, and so every place that it sweeps, it makes the RMS power the same. 
right? And you can see how that works. You know, instead of uh, uh, being able to identify the service waves as the strongest, uh, highest amplitude waves, now we have to identify them by their phase. You know, the uh, their low frequency. We can still see that, uh, and also their velocity. We can we can see hints of their velocity, but it's uh, definitely helped us uh, uh, notice that that. You know, also the very low amplitude noise is, is brought right out. Okay, we can see the noise. Um, we can see the first arrivals pretty well in, across many of the traces. Notice uh, uh, in the south part of the survey, uh, the first arrivals are not very clear, um, and be, that's because it's uh, very muddy. Uh, but here's some beautiful first arrivals here. Now you might notice uh, that there's uh, kind of a, a blank gutter around the first arrival. I don't know if you can see that in the video. Um, you know, and you can play with the software that, that we use, uh, the the ViewMat or uh, GRG 500 software. You can play with that and uh, and see what uh, you can apply. Uh, take a data set and apply uh, automatic gain control and and uh, see what happens. Um, What's happening here is that is that the automatic gain control has some length of the trace that it looks for, you know, some number of time points, you know, maybe 100 or 50 in this case, and um, that's what it's, you know, that's how it's getting the uh, the RMS power, right? It doesn't can't do that on every on every single uh, time point. It's got to have some range of time points to uh, to RMS together. So. Um, What's happening here is that there's a very strong, you know, uh, the noise is at an extremely low amplitude, and the uh, the uh, uh, first arrival, although it's not terribly strong, is strong enough that it's uh, much stronger than the, uh, the 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 noise that was there uh, prior, and uh, you know, so as soon as that uh, that window of uh, RMS analysis, you know, hits that uh, first arrival. Then uh, it says, "Oh, okay. We don't have to boost this up as much, and that that accounts for the gutter here." All right, uh, but you can see even where you know there isn't a gutter, it's still possible, you know, based on the uh, just how the 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 black positives uh, swings of the seismograms line up with the uh, you know from trace to trace, and the the white negative swings of the seismograms line up. It's possible to trace different phases and, and think about their velocity. And here's a, a possible reflection that came out, uh, you know, down below. Okay, we couldn't see that in the, uh, uh, couldn't see much of it uh, in the original uh, uh, un-gain uh, uh, controlled data. So that's an AGC. Uh, here's a filter test. Now I've, I've, you know, I've, I've taken away the, uh, uh, the gain control. You know, went back to the raw data. And I applied a bandpass filter that uh, you know selected very strongly for zero to twenty-five hertz. Okay, and what do we see here? Well, all we see are the slow uh, surface waves, right? The slow Rayleigh waves. Uh, there's another effect uh, illustrated here, uh, and those waves are so slow that they uh, they cause uh, spatial aliasing. Remember, uh, you know, the lower the apparent velocity, the uh, um, the higher the potential for spatial aliasing. So it's not just high frequency that causes spatial aliasing, it's, a, it's also low apparent velocity. And so even these low frequency waves, uh, Rayleigh waves, are spatially aliased. And you can see that you know, the blacks are lining up down to the right. But we know that the waves are propagating from the sources on the left hand side of each, of each uh, array in the roll along spread. So uh, uh, you know, it's a false. Uh, you know, that's actually spatial aliasing wraparound. Uh, it's a, it's a false uh, direction that's it, that's uh, created by the spatial aliasing. Now, you know, when you have, uh, if you had just had two of these traces, you know, you would have no clue about which way the way was actually going. But because we have, you know, twelve traces here, more than just two, you know, we can see we can see how the package of energy really is propagating. But there's a great deal, you know, this uh, um, the zero to twenty-five hertz bandpass is showing us, you know, really nothing but the Rayleigh waves, and the Rayleigh waves are so slow that they're showing us um, uh, that they're showing us um, uh, spatial aliasing. 
Okay. Now here's just another example. I'm not going to take you through uh, all of them that I ask you to do in the uh, in the reflection um, um, in the uh, reflection lab. Um, you know, this is the 100 to 150 hertz uh, bandpass, and um, uh, you know we've gotten rid of a lot of the Rayleigh wave energy. There's still some vestige of it. It's it's hard to get rid of all of it. Um, there's not so much of the uh, well. You can see the the air wave is is enhanced here, and uh, you know so we're looking at the low frequency part of the air wave, and it's 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 quite strong. It's interfering. Okay. Um, the other thing that we're seeing very strongly, and this is what we want now, it's the first arrivals are quite strong, and also the reflections are are nicely strong at this 100 150 hertz. Uh, uh, band, uh, band pass, and then here's uh, some higher frequency data, and you know the data that we'll get uh, is going to have a similar uh, frequency profile, um, and in the video you probably can't see any of this. Um, so this is from 300 to 500 hertz, and you can see the airwave. Okay, so there's the airwave. Okay, from there to there, airwave from there to there. Some hints. You know, maybe a little bit of uh, actually aliased, um, uh, especially alias reflections and uh, and first arrivals, but you know, mostly airwave. Okay, so the the bandpass has helped us to identify different waves, and and now you know we can look at the spectrum. So this is you know the log of the uh, spectral power uh, versus um, uh, versus uh, frequency in hertz. So we got a thousand hertz on the right and zero hertz on the left, one hundred hertz, two hundred hertz, three hundred hertz, and so forth. You can see that uh, you know beyond six hundred hertz, the spectrum is falling way off. There's really nothing there, um, and uh, uh, we can see the uh, the geophone sensitivity rolling off very strongly. Uh, below 100 hertz, right? It's going down to zero very quickly on the on the low end, and that's not in the least unusual. Um, so the uh, surface waves, remember that below 25 hertz, so just you know on the very left hand side, there was really nothing but uh, surface waves, and the surface waves are most energetic uh, at the peak here of the of the whole data set, which is. Uh, uh, about uh, 75, 80 hertz, uh, but uh, at this notch here, that's the peak of the reflections and the refractions. You know, that's they're living up at about 140 hertz uh, on average. But I drew this dashed line in here to indicate that uh, you know what, there's plenty of reflection refraction energy that's still down at 80 hertz. So I might think, all right, you know, I can do better. I can get rid of almost all the surface wave, right? Like, you know. 90% of the surface wave energy I can get rid of by by taking a low cut filter, you know, or a bandpass filter that starts at a low frequency of uh, 140 hertz. But you know what that's also going to do? It's going to get rid of um, it's going to get rid of half of my reflection and refraction energy, and that's not not going to help at all. So you know we got to we got to come up with a strategy here that's a little more uh, finesse than that. Uh, the airwave uh, is is responsible for this next notch. The airwave is over here at above 200 hertz. So uh, you know, by the time we get down to here, you know, at at what is that, 220 hertz, um, there's not a lot of uh, of reflection energy left. So uh, it might be safe to do a uh, a high cut filter above say 225 hertz. So here's the uh, uh, yeah, the filter that I that I decided to use at the time, I kept everything between 80 and 300 hertz, so it was an 80 to 300 hertz uh, bandpass BP filter, um, and you know we still have uh, some Rayleigh wave in there, uh, very slow. You can see it by its velocity, as well as its uh, uh, you know now everything's about the same frequency, right? So we can't really tell the waves apart on the basis of frequency. Not so much. Uh, the Rayleigh waves are still on the lower end. The air waves are still at the upper end, and you know we've brought out the reflections uh, a little bit. Okay, this is uh, you know let's compare this with the uh, original 
data. Okay, up here somewhere. All right, there's the original data. You know, the uh, the Rayleigh waves are really the strongest thing, and that's that's not going to give us much of a reflection image. Okay, so with simple bandpass filtering now, um, I should get down to the right section. Um, we're uh, uh, we're now looking at uh, uh, at the some of the stronger energy anyway in the upper part. I mean, still, yeah, there's some reflection here, but the airways are strong, the surface waves are strong, so. You know, below uh, maybe uh, 0.15 seconds, 150 milliseconds, uh, two-way travel time. You know, we're not we're not we're seeing a lot of noise, but above that, closer to the surface, you know, most of the energy is reflections. So uh, uh, that's uh, that's that's better. Now here's uh, uh, all of the raw records. Uh, I think there are uh, 75 records or so, and I'm sure you can't see it in the vi in the video, but uh, for every record, there's uh, this down to the left uh, zippering effect, and uh, so you know, 75 records times 12 traces. There's that many traces plotted in this one uh, in this one thing, okay? Um, and it's only three megabytes, right? That's not much anymore. Uh, when I recorded this data set, it was a big deal because uh, it was uh, you know, it was more than you could fit on a floppy disk, right? Uh, any, any of you, I don't know if any of you remember floppies, but uh, that's what we used to have to use. Okay, so you know, here's all the traces from all the records, right? And they're all shot gathers, all shot records. So now the challenge is, uh, you know, how do we uh, how do we organize uh, uh, those data? Okay, and um, so I want to give you a uh, a little bit of uh, of guidance on um, um, on how we we do the uh, the data organization. Okay, um, and the uh, um, I'm going to use a synthetic data set to illustrate that. So here is a uh, here's a cross section, and uh, there's uh, distance x and depth z, and uh, these symbols that you can't really see uh, here are uh, a whole bunch of uh, of geophones and uh, inverted triangles and a whole bunch of asterisks which are uh, sources. Okay, and we have a uh, a flat reflector at the top. And there's a left dipping reflector uh, down uh, further, and then uh, and then there's a uh, another flat reflector right near the bottom, just right above the bottom. Okay, so we're going to have 50 shot records recorded across this data set. Okay, and uh, another thing that's uh, uh, notable about the synthetic data set to keep things simple, I have. Um, Kept velocity constant uh, through this data set, uh, through this this model, right? This cross section, uh, and the way that I create reflections is by uh, varying the density. Okay, but uh, you know we should see some pretty nice, neat uh, hyperbolas here. Okay, so uh, here's how to create a stacking chart for uh, for this uh, this data set. Um, and I give you the uh, uh, the equations for uh, calculating how far apart the midpoints should be. All right, so you have a uh, an interval between uh, sources delta s and the interval between receivers is delta g. Take the minimum of those, you divide by two, and that's going to be your the, your interval between midpoints. At least your it's your minimum interval between midpoints. You can have large intervals if you want. Uh, and then for each of those uh, those minimum inter uh, midpoint intervals. Okay, the fold you get from this uh, equation. The fold is the number of traces that get summed into each trace of a common midpoint stack. Okay, that'll be the number of geophones that uh, that appear 
in each uh, common midpoint uh, gather or section or time section. So the maximum fold, okay, uh, you know, the real fold depends on where you are, but it's going to max out at the number of geophones per shot times the interval between the geophones divided by the interval between the sources, okay, and then you've got to take uh, half of that. And that gives you the maximum fold. So here we have um, uh, interval between sources of two meters, interval between geophones of two meters. So delta G cancels out with delta S. It's uh, two over two is equal to one. The number of geophones is uh, 50, uh, 50 geophones uh, or 50 receiver groups per uh, uh, per shot, and uh, divide by two. And so the maximum fold is 25. Okay, for each, you know, 25 traces per midpoint. Uh, and now um, let's try to understand uh, 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 how this stacking chart works. Okay, um, so if I think about the uh, the data volume, all right, what I've got uh, um, is uh, uh, you know here's the uh, this axis here is the location of the source, and uh, you know I have zero at the top and a hundred at the bottom, so that's the X coordinate of the uh, of the source, all right, and then um, this is a roll along survey. So the there was always a geophone that was right at the source, and then there was always a geophone that was 100 meters to the uh, to the right of the source. Okay, the 50th geophone was 100 meters to the um, further up the line from the source, and the source would move by two meters, and all the geophones would move in their absolute. Uh, um, Coordinate uh, x coordinate by uh, two meters as well, and so the survey would stay together. Uh, so this this lateral uh, this lateral um, uh, 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 axis here is the offset. Okay, it's the distance between the source and the receiver. So on the left hand side you have zero distance. That means the receiver is at the source location. Okay, and on the right-hand side, it's it's at this the actual location of the receiver uh, of the geophone is uh, the source x uh, plus uh, hundred meters. Okay, so now let's 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 find you know where are the traces that have the same midpoint. Okay, so um, uh, and and you can see uh, I've got the advantage of having these axes already plotted here to guide me. Um, so if I want to look at uh, uh, the midpoint that's at uh, x equals 100, okay. So uh, if I have the source at x equals 100, and I have the receiver at zero at, at 100 plus zero offset, okay, zero meters offset, then that midpoint of that trace is x equals 100. So you know this lower left-hand corner is one place where we have x equals 100. Okay, let's look at this one here. Um, where I have these axes intersecting, we've got a, the source at 60, okay, and then the uh, the receiver is at 60 meters plus uh, 80 meters offset, so the receiver is actually at uh, at 140, so the source is at 60 and the receiver is at 140. The average of, of those is 100, and that's uh, so it's at the same midpoint that's at x equals 100, okay. So you know if we draw this this you know line that connects. Uh, you know, here's a, a trace at midpoint uh, at 100 meters. Here's another trace that's at a midpoint of uh, uh, 100 meters. All right, we draw a line connecting those and extend it. You know, through the uh, across the stacking chart. So any trace, any geophone that lands on that line, is going to go into that midpoint gather. And in fact, we can look at the width of that uh, of that line here, and uh, that's. Uh, uh, that's going to be the fold, okay? And we reach maximum fold uh, up here at the upper right-hand corner. Um, and uh, and so this axis that's perpendicular to that that gives us the midpoint location, okay? So uh, way up here, you know, and then extending a line that's uh, that's parallel to the uh, first line we drew, right? Because all midpoints are connected by lines that are parallel to this. Uh, um, uh, to this original line we drew, okay. So this trace here is uh, 
you know, source is at zero uh, meters and the receiver is at, is at zero meters plus zero meters. So um, uh, uh, the midpoint is zero, okay? So that uh, that's a zero on the midpoint axis, all right? And here's uh, the one trace that's at 150 on the midpoint axis, okay? So these, these lines uh, don't tilt. Uh, they can just move back and forth. Now, um, with a synthetic data set, right, uh, I can uh, um, I can emulate having a chirp survey, okay, and uh, I can just pull out, you know, if I if I take all the geophones that are at zero offset, right, if I took the left hand side of the stacking chart and I plotted them in a time section, right, so we have uh, the x corner to the midpoint, you know, from zero to one hundred. And we have time going down from zero to 150 milliseconds. Okay, for this particular model survey. All right. So uh, here's a strong wave. You know, at the time of the source. Here's uh, the uh, first reflection. Here's the dipping reflection, and there's the flat reflection that's just above the bottom. There's also some multiple reflections in here. Like, notice this reflection here is weaker. But it's parallel to the uh, the first reflection, and the clue that it's a multiple, it's always at exactly twice the time. Okay, so that's a, a multiple. Another kind of multiple is here. Uh, uh, well, here's the uh, here's the reflection from the dipping layer, and then here's a multiple of it, but it's not at twice the time. Notice it's at uh, at the dipping layer time plus the time of the first reflection. So actually, the dipping layer reflection gets all the way back to the surface, then it bounces down to the uh, uh, to the first reflector and and adds uh, and comes back, and so that multiple it's uh, you could call that a peg leg multiple. That multiple adds uh, this. Uh, let's see. So twice the first layer time. There's three times the first layer time, and then here stronger is the uh, um, <coughs> is the uh, uh, the lower uh, reflector. Now, one of the questions I'm sure you have is, all right, how do you tell? Uh, can you really tell the multiples from the uh, um, uh, from the the primary reflections? I mean, the primary reflections are the ones we want to pay attention to, you know. And how do you decide which ones are the multiples? Uh, uh, you know, and and where um, uh, you know that that relationship where you get peg leg multiples, you know, you're not necessarily at uh, you know twice or three times the time, um, and there's other complications that can come in that usually make it, in fact, in a zero offset uh, section like this, a chirp survey, uh, it, it can be very difficult to tell uh, what which are multiples. Now the other problem we have is that you know this is a synthetic data set and it's complicated enough, okay. Here's uh, that data set I was showing you, okay. And here are the 75 traces that are the, uh, uh, the if not zero um, uh, offset, you know, the, the minimum offset traces, right? So, uh, you know, all the reflections should be in here, but they're not, okay. What we're seeing here is just, you know, the noise from the source, okay. And if we look back at the uh, um, if you look back at these uh, original uh, records, you know even even after filtering, and I'll try to stop the uh, okay. I'll try to stop the <laughs> the scrolling here. Okay, even after filtering, right? Uh, you know here here there's one near offset trace. Here's another near offset trace. Another near offset trace. The near offset traces are the ones that are absolutely the noisiest. Okay, they're full of energy that is coming off the ringing of the steel plate that we hit the hammer with. Uh, you name it, um, and whether we use a, a you know drilled dynamite source or a fiber size machine, um, those near offset traces are for for land work. Okay, for work on land, they're the noisiest, and uh, so we you know we have this zero offset section, but we can't use it. We can't do anything. With it. So this is why we have to have stacking. This is why we have to have a common midpoint technique, uh, and why we have to do NMO correction and uh, and stack. Okay, because 
you know, like, like you can do so successfully and so easily with a marine chirp survey, okay, if there's water, you know, seismic reflection costs uh, a small fraction of what it does on land, okay? So, um, you know, Graham Kent and his students, they have, uh, they have the benefit of beautiful, clean data sets that they can collect quickly and cheaply. And, uh, and I have, you know, wanting to work on land uh, where I can see the geology, I have, um, uh, I have these horrible, noisy data sets. And uh, okay, so this is where we're going to go, okay, in the, uh, in the fifth lecture on seismic reflection. Okay, we're going to emulate the uh, the zero offset section, emulate the chirp survey with a stack. Okay, and here is the stack that uh, we're going to get um, from the uh, from the synthetic data set. All right, and uh, you can see it goes a little bit further because you know the uh, non-zero offset traces it you know went farther to the right. Um, and there's that uh, first reflector, and there's the dipping reflector, and you can see a lot of the same uh, uh, multiples. Uh, notice that the multiple of the dipping uh, uh, layer is not nearly as strong in the stack, uh, so that's one actual advantage to the stack. Um, there's the uh, uh, the flat layer near the bottom. Okay, so um, uh, this is what we're going to learn to do now. You know, we're basically uh, because we have land data, you know, we've got junk for uh, near offset traces, uh, zero offset traces. So we're going to have to try to emulate this uh, this zero offset uh, section, okay? Which is we can start to make some geological interpretations, but we've got to emulate that with a stack. So we got to learn how to make a stack from our original records, and we'll continue in the uh, fifth lecture.